Certainly, because emotions are non-conscious and we have biases that we live with and we can be hardwired to the negative, which is very useful because yeah. that helps prevent us from, from making terrible errors and it's, it, can, it results in, in social isolation, in mental illness, in a whole range of things. Or we can be taught, and we do have another overriding high-level cortical component, which is to be much more positive and driven and focused and goal-set. And, and think our way out of very difficult situations, you know, which your dog or your cat couldn't do. So if you think of coaching and we come down to it, it's really, number one, a form of change management. Number two, it is applied neuroscience, dealing with non-conscious emotions, with semi-conscious feelings and very conscious thoughts. And finally, it really means that we have to engage as agents of change in a whole range of motivational sciences if we want to make a living out of a very difficult industry because you're seeing guys who've been established for a quarter of a century going bankrupt every day. In the rehabilitation setting, for example, in with, in within physical therapy, that neuroscience has an impact on the rehabilitation after an, ex, after an accident or an injury? Well, certainly there... because... Sure, because the, the, the brain responds with all of that knowledge that something has gone wrong because fundamentally the brain's, the body's message to the brain is, listen, dude, I'm angry with you. You have exceeded certain limits or you've made a stupid step and I'm going to respond um, with a whole range of things. And pain is a big one because although we think of the brain as having all the memory, there are neurons along the spine which behave as if they were in the hippocampus, as if they were in the memory and emotional centers. And they remember the pain and they can absolutely work as if they were full-on temporal lobe neurons. And dealing with those effectively is really important with pain control, with heat and cold control, because that information which is stored by the spine and stored by the pain centers is really going to affect everything in terms of cognition. And of course, depression and pain are very closely associated. People who take physical disability have a 70% chance of becoming mentally ill while they're on disability. And if you look at people on disability, they have the same level of symptoms as people who are not on disability, and yet their interpretation of their situation is that they are disabled. But you're going to find the same level and extent of disability in perfectly happy people, and it's all about mood, and it's all about how you respond, and it's all about memory centers and deep emotional centers, and the most referential ones are not in the amygdala where all the negative emotions are, they're in the self-referential parts of the brain that we can get to, like the insula, which is high in disgust recognition and high in self-referential stuff. Is the, the relationship that a physical therapist has with their client in a treatment process, is that more important or as important as the actual application of the treatment that's being provided? It's critical because, remember, there's a big res a difference between what people intend to do and what they actually do. And secondly, it is not about you making some kind of inspiring speech or knowing exactly what to do with your hands and muscles and, and, uh, and tissue, soft tissue of the body. It is about establishing a warm, supportive relationship, a warm, engaging relationship in which the person encounters their own healing, in which a person begins to believe and trust. It's not about believing that you're good from your certificates. It's about trusting the process that you're bringing and consequently then using your voice is as important as your hands. It doesn't matter how technically skilled you are as a PT. It really, and I use the words, American words here, physical trainer, which is uh, akin to our physical therapist and physiotherapist. It is really about how you engage with that client and inspire trust in them that what you're doing is going to have a difference because their pain, their disability, their body's anger at them for hurting it is going to type in all their emotions, going to be expressed in a whole range of inflammatory cytokine releases, substance P, neuropeptide, while all the things we see in special forces that help us mitigate our injury and pain response. Because if you think about it, the, the pain is the body's way of saying you to avoid certain movement and to avoid certain uh, stuff just to save you. The, the body really doesn't know that this, that physical therapist exists. I'll give an example. You tear all your cruciate ligaments you have a look at all those elements of, of things that are going on and you realize that there is a, you know, a whole of soup of relationships and disabilities and pain and messages because the body's telling you to avoid stuff and chasing the pain is not going to help because people are avoiding things. If you tear your anterior cruciate ligaments, your brain doesn't know there's a surgeon coming. Your brain tells the uninjured leg to act as a stump and therefore you're going to lose your mobility in the unaffected leg because that leg doesn't know that it's going to be called into, into play as, a, as one of two. It's losing its idea that it is part of a partnership. 
So then again, you can't just deal with the injury. You can't just chase the pain. You've got to realize the entire body is adapting to the painful area. So if I've got problems in the left side of my hip, what is my right gluteus medius doing? What is uh, iliacus and so is doing? What is happening with the piriform? It's you have to answer those questions. Chasing the pain means the brain is telling the body to do a whole lot of things. And if you don't engage with that as a physical therapist, you're just chasing the pain. What about all the compensatory stuff going on for when that's all done? So someone could potentially be repair themselves without actually any physical intervention as such? Well, the... possibly not. Well, you know, the point is there is tissue damage. There is something going on. There's inflammatory stuff and everything else. Unfortunately, all of that processing is going to have an emotional component. So while we have to address the physical side, the pain where you're seeing it, where it's being reflected, might not be the whole picture. Mm. And that's why you cannot avoid coaching or fixing or working with emotion because the minute you're hurt, the minute you're disturbed, the minute you're trying to put on muscle or lose weight or gain weight or do whatever it is, there is an emotional component that has to be dealt with. Is this the, the premise for the concept of the placebo? Well, placebo is real. We always think of placebo as not real. Mm. But placebo actually, you know, if you look at antidepressants, um, they're not beating placebo by more than 10-12%. Mm. And this is the story again about the warm relationship. I have a psychiatrist in Adelaide who's a wonderful person, he's an amazing guy, and he says, I cannot believe that people get better because I'm a really nice guy. <laughs> and that's the truth because obviously we come back now to a very important thing in coaching is self-efficacy from Alfred Bandura's social science network of, of the stuff that he wrote he spoke about something in terms of change people change when they believe that what they're about to do actually can be done and that they can do it so if you think about that in those if you go behind all of the models of behavioral change in health, and there's seven of them, they all heavily load on this one prospect. Mm. Number one, looking forward, do I believe in what I'm doing this time will be different, this time will work, and then in fact, what I do here makes a difference. Now, if you look at coaching, you look at training, look at doctors, look at all these relationships, they are absolutely not relying on an expert because if they do rely on an expert to drive you and guide you, you're violating the first principle of human beings, which is autonomy, the desire to direct my own life. And if you link self-efficacy to this, to this desire, the desire to do my whole life in my direction and the desire to do what I believe will make a difference, mm. which means what is the role of the expert? And that's why I speak of client-centered, or better still, client-directed training where the client actually directs the process and content of what is to happen, which supports their self-efficacy. So more of an empowerment or permission, perhaps? Or well, think that... about it. How many, it's a definition of a relationship, exactly as you said. So if I walk into a room and I say to you, I need your help, I'm actually defining the relationship as one in which you will help me, and if you don't, you're in trouble. And unfortunately, I've defined what that might be. So reading my books you'll see that I speak a lot about the different types of relationships, some of which are complementary, some of which are parallel, some of which are symmetrical, and each one of these can give you problems. And becoming aware of these expert roles which actually disempower the client and rob them of their self-efficacy and rob them of their belief, their, their need for autonomy. In other words, what is important to me and how I drive my life forward in doing what is important to me. And believing that what I do makes a difference actually violates this therapeutic relationship that we have as trainers and coaches. Yeah. Because we are approaching this as an expert who tells people what to do. And they will do it. And when they don't, they're non-compliant and resistant. That makes this potentially an adversarial relationship. Like a GPs. Now, you know, Peter Senge wrote in the fifth discipline, people don't mind change. But they hate being told to change. And yet that's what we do. Mm. Good yeah, coaches I'll... and good PTs should be asking, not telling. And the basis of motivation interviewing, the basis of self-determination interviewing, is in fact to ask questions and respond to those answers in such a way that you help support the patient's desire for autonomy. You help support their belief that what they're about to do will make a difference and this time will be different compared to their previous failures because previous failures undermine, through learning theory in our brain, undermine our belief that what we're about to do makes a difference. It's always that, yeah, right, the ho-hum construct, that when we make an inspiring speech, a 
get one for the get, but go out there and I'll trash you, we're actually violating all the things that would have retained them and engaged them in healthy behavior. We're going, what we practice and what science knows and has shown again and again are two entirely different things. You know that coaches take over a team. They take over from a coach who might have failed. 